Uh, you, you paint a fabulous portrait of him uh, in your memoir, and I have to ask, because you're the only person in the world that I could ask this to, does it feel weird to grow up thinking that your father may be, and I can, you can only really say this of Orson Welles, perhaps the most talented man of the 20th century, any weird pressure or something there? I mean, how did, how did this really affect you? Hmm. Well, uh, it, because it was only a rumor, uh, although, and, and the rumor came, it came up and then subsided and came up and subsided through most of my adult life. And there were times, see, my mother always said it wasn't true. My mother, when I questioned her, would say, no, no, it wasn't true. We didn't have an affair. We didn't do it. He wasn't your father. He just was a nice friend. Um, th that, that it wasn't true. They did have an affair, because I know now for, for several reasons whether I'm the result of that, it looks like it. But they did have an affair. So my mother did not tell me the truth, but she didn't tell me the truth for her own reasons. It wasn't that she was <laughs> like the character tonight in the movie. Uh, she wasn't evil. Uh, but sometimes you sort of make deals with yourself and you think, in order for my life to go on the way I need it to go on, some things have to be buried or altered or looked at in a different way. So I think that's why she did it. So um, when it came out that the, it looks like Orson is my father, they were all dead. Um, Orson was dead, my Edward Lindsay Hogg was dead, my mother was dead. And so the place that they'd always been in my life, that's where they remain. Orson had been a consistently inconsistent person in my life, to a degree that when we finished the play in Dublin, he was going to direct um, Rhinoceros by Ian Esco with Lars Olivier in London. He says, I'd like you to work with me as my assistant. I said, gee, that'd be great. So he said, I'm going to London tomorrow, you're in Ireland, I'll call you in a few days to tell you when to come over. All eager. I didn't hear from him for another four years. <laughs> and four years later, I'm going to direct Ready, Steady, Go, my rock and roll television show, and I get an announcement over the speaker, a telephone call from Michael Lindsay, hug, telephone call. So I go and pick it up, and uh, it's Mrs. Rogers, who's Orson's secretary, and she says, oh, Michael, I haven't spoken to you for a while. And I said, no, no, no. She said, Mr. Wells would like to ha you to have dinner with him tonight uh, with Marlena Dietrich. Are you free? Uh, she, I said, no, I'm doing the television show. I can't make it till 11. Is that okay? No, it's too late. She's got a flight to Paris in the morning. I know Mr. Wells will be disappointed, she said. I didn't hear from him for another four years. <laughs> um, so when I say he was consistently inconsistent, that's what it was like. So he was, he was not a person who, with all his great talent and his wit and his jokes and so on, who particularly liked any form of family bond. I mean, he, he, he had uh, his affections for people, and often he behaved in a very affectionate way to me. But it wasn't really what he was interested in. He was interested in his work. And I think family was an intrusion, in a way. Um, so when it all sort of came out, resolution, as I say, they, they, they take in their, their, you know, like in your life you have your parents and people you care about, people you don't care about, and after a while they're sort of set. They're like actors at a part, and those are the parts they're playing. And so by the time it all shook out, that's, that, those are the parts they all were playing. And so I'm, I'm, I'm me. I mean, that's good and that's bad, too. Um, but also, you know, I was lucky when you said one of the greatest men, because when I did rock and roll, I worked with John Lennon. And so I, I'm very lucky. I sit here in Palm Springs at the Noir Festival, but I was, I was lucky that I, I have come in contact with people of exceptional ability. Well, there's a nice transition. Uh, Alan did tease that you were one of the first people to really work uh, in translating rock and roll into the, the media age uh, on television and then in films. Uh, just t tell us a little bit about that, what must have been an incredibly heady time, uh, and how you got into that. And uh, Michael worked with the Rolling Stones and the Beatles uh, in England, and you had a phenomenal line in your book where you just said, 
uh, in working with the Beatles, you said, I was going to work for the four most famous people in the history of the world, which is true. That's, they absolutely were. And uh, yeah, you're, I'm glad you quoted that because at the time, and it's hard now, you know, that we now are in the 21st century, we're talking about just after the middle of the 20th century, is they were the f four most famous people in the world. Their faces were on every magazine cover and every album cover and every newspaper, on television, Ed Sullivan. And because they were so good, as well as being so famous and so talented, you couldn't get them out of your, your mind or your mind's eye. And so, so when I met them for the first time, uh, I was waiting in a room for them. And uh, when they came in, it wasn't like people coming in anymore. It was like characters in the cartoons. It was like Mickey and Donald and Archie and Jughead, that their faces had become so famous, they'd taken on like a different yeah. dimension. Yeah. Um, rock and roll videos, in the early days, bands, first of all, everyone thought rock and roll was going to be a fad like the hula hoop, and it was going to have a kind of clock on it, whether it's 10 years or 12 years, and no one could have imagined it's gone on like it has. Um, the bands normally, English bands performed in English television shows, pop shows, and I, I directed one of them, a good one called Ready Steady Go, and American bands were on Hullabaloo and Shindig and things like that. But in England, particularly, the Beatles and the Rolling Stones uh, were so successful um, that they were able to say to the television stations, we're going to produce a video, we're going to give you something to play, and if you don't want to play it, you won't have us, which also allowed them to be playing in Germany when they were in England, so it was like that. I mean, it's what happens now, but it hadn't happened then. Um, because of this rock and roll show I was directing, Ready, Steady, Go, which the Rolling Stones are on once every six weeks, The Who, we discovered the Who. Um, the Beatles asked to do a video with me, which was Paperback Writer in Rain. Um, and then, because I'd gotten friendly, particularly with Mick Jagger, um, I did theirs, Jumping Jack Flash, and then the Rolling Stones Rock and Roll Circus, and then the Beatles movie Let It Be. Uh, but the, the videos really were because the Stones and the Beatles, A, were powerful enough, and B, there were real security issues at the time. I mean, like people throwing themselves off the roof at them and things like that. Um, and so that's where videos came from. And there was, yeah, geez, you know, it's the right place at the right time. And um, then, of course, it, 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 rather like uh, th throwing a rock in a, in a pool, the ripples went out and went out, and out, and you had MTV. Um, but early on, it was really like a cottage industry. I mean, there were very few of us doing videos, and very few of us doing it, you know, with the Beatles and the Stones, mm -hmm. mainly me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, but, but it was interesting also because it seemed like you really wanted to do music videos, but the idea was we just really want to see them perform. Right, because your your original concept for Paperback Writer was truly a music video. Yeah, I wanted to do um, a, a sort of story form video, um, which was uh, the Beatles working in a newspaper office, and one of them wants to be a Paperback Writer, and it would have scenes and it would all add up and be and it'd be good, but it, it, it would take them out of standing in the stage and playing their guitars. But Brian Epstein didn't want that. This is the year before he died. He wanted it to just to be, a, as he called it, a video of the boys performing. So that's what we did. We shot it fairly simply, fairly straight, and we, over two days. Um, the next time I did a video with the Beatles, it was Hey Jude and Revolution, and Brian had died. And I talked to McCartney about it, and um, we realized that the money was, this is going to sound like a pretty clear remark, the money was the Beatles. So if you have those four faces and a great song, you didn't particularly want to mess it up with having them be in monkey suits and doing something else. You just wanted to see them perform. But then we realized we did the Hey Jude video, and if you've seen it, a lot of people come on at the end and sing along with them. Um, it, had a, it, had a, it had a growing sense to the video. It turned out not to be just them, but it turned out to be the world, a kind of microcosm of the world. Um, but, but, um, and then when I worked with the Stones, I've also done story videos with them, but more often it's just them performing because if you have Mick Jagger at his prime and, and Keith Richards, if you like that kind of music, you don't want to look at anything but them. You want to see what they do. 